Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We do stand before a holy God, and so it, it, uh, it begs the question, uh, as you're going about life and doing the things that you do, do you realize that you're in the presence of holiness? And does that knowledge affect you in the way that you live or act or speak or think? Because it should. Every one of us here, in fact, came somewhat distracted by life. We have pains and we have problems. We have victories and successes. We have so many things that distract us from seeing God more clearly. And so here in Joshua 7 today, we're going to see that God is holy. And even when we forget it, he reminds us. And sometimes the reminder is painful. Sometimes the reminder is encouraging. Whatever it is, God will work to remind us that he is holy. So as we read through Joshua 7, I'm actually going to read a couple of other verses before we get into it. Joshua 6, 18, well, we're going to go 17, 18, and 19. And then we're going to take it up again in Joshua 6, 27. So starting in Joshua 6, 17. And the city and all that is in it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for, dis for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. Verse 27. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame was in all the land. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth-Avon, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not have all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So about three thousand men went up from there, or went up, up there from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shera Shebarim and struck them at the descent and the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? To give us into the hands of the Amorites? To destroy us? Would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. O oh Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? Verse 10. The Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put, among, and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Get up. Consecrate the people and say, Con consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes. And the tribe that the Lord takes by lot shall come near by clans. And the clan that the Lord takes shall come near by households. And the household that the Lord takes shall come near man by man. And he who, ha who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire. He and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. Verse 16. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near tribe by tribe, and the tribe of Judah was taken. 
And he brought near the clans of Judah, and the clan of Zerahites was taken. And he brought near the clans of the Zerahites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought near his household man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel, and give praise to him, and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, Truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar, and 20, or 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, shekels, then I coveted them, and I took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. Verse 22. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. And they took him out to, of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel. They laid them down before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold, and his sons and daughters and his oxen and donkeys and sheep and his tent and all that he had, and they brought them up to the valley of Achor. And jo Joshua said, Why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones, and they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned it from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, you are holy, you are perfect, and you don't put up with anything less. Lord, we, we know that in our lives... We are distracted by lesser things. But Lord, may you draw our attention to you. May you draw our hearts to you. May you draw our devotion to you. May you draw our minds and our wills and our desires to you, knowing that you are holy above all things. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Israel's getting a lesson in holiness. And we're going to take a look at their mistakes. The... the the story is flavored with a covenant that God had made with Israel, told back in the book of Deuteronomy, and we'll look at that in a second. Uh, the purpose of this covenant, though, is twofold. God was going to receive glory and honor and praise, and the people are going to receive rest. That's, that's how this covenant is going to play out. And the agreement contained both promised blessings and corresponding cursings, based on obedience and disobedience. The chapter of Joshua is not intended to just describe cursings to us, rather is to show how serious God is about holiness. So I want us to keep these three things in mind. God is holy. Everything he is is unique within himself. There's nothing like him in all creation. He is utterly perfect. Therefore, his work is holy. From his desires and his will to his revelations and his plans and his commands, his work is beyond compare. There is nothing like his work. His work is holy. But then he also calls his people to be holy. Their obedience to, their, to his commands is a part of their participation in holiness. But obedience springs from the heart. So he's actually looking at their wills, at their hearts, at their desires. And he desires to have men and women who desire his pleasure. That's our outline for, the, for today. God is holy, his work is holy, and he calls his people to be holy. That's, that's a beautiful thing, holiness. Now, have you ever gone on a hike with somebody who knew where they were going, but you didn't? You get out of the pickup and you get all your stuff on. He's like, well, we're going about five miles that way. I'll tell you about it when we get to the top of this first rise. Okay, so you get all ready and you, and you head out. And half mile down, down the, the trail, you get up to the, this first rise, top of this first hill. And he stops you. Okay, now, now you can see the lay of the land. We're, gonna, we're going that way three, three hills over. Um, and you're going to be going down this trail. And all. This is a little checkpoint you've found. You don't know where you're going, but he does. And so he gives you the opportunity to get your bearings. Okay? You also take that opportunity while you're on top of the hill to take inventory of life. Oh, it's, it's shale and it's, it's broken rock and so it's slick. I got to make sure I'm 
being careful when I'm going down the hill. Or um, maybe this is the, the north side of the hill, and so it's mossy. i got to make sure I'm not going to slip on that stuff. Or maybe it's super sunny outside, and I don't want to get a sunburn, so you, you know, cover your bald head and stuff. You take a drink of water. You tighten up your backpack. This little checkpoint is there to provide opportunity for you to engage in the rest of the hike. Okay? Hebrew writing has, checks, has checkpoints in it also. Opportunities where you intentionally pause for a second and take inventory of how the story's been going. You look back, and there's characters, and there's ebb, and there's flow, and there's good, and there's evil, right? You, you remember what's going on, but the story doesn't just continue on. There's this thing that pops up, and you're like, oh, I have to intentionally admit where the story is at. That checkpoint quite often is a genealogy. The story's been going up to a point, and now genealogy hits. Somebody is introduced, and there's going to be a change in the story. The genealogy of chapter 7, verse 1, the genealogy of Achan, should cause us to realize there's a change that's about to take place. A major change. Now, not all changes are bad. The, in, in the from Old Testament to New Testament deal... Matthew starts out with a genealogy. But the person at the end of that genealogy is Jesus. And you realize, oh, something good is at stake. Now, you don't always know exactly what's going to happen, right? When, when we're introduced to Jesus and his genealogy, we're not then told about Jesus' story. We actually get Zechariah and John the Baptist and all this other stuff, okay? But when Jesus comes in, you're still not sure what he's doing in the story, but you do know because of that genealogy, the story has changed. Matthew has changed for the good. Joshua 7 has changed for the ugly. Up until this point, it's been all triumphant, victorious. The people are obeying and God is being faithful. It even summarizes everything by chapter 6, verse 20, uh, 27. The Lord was with Joshua and his fame was in all the land. Awesome. Awesome. They're, they're winning. They're taking the land, right? God had protected his people the way he said he would. He provided victory the way he said he would. He provided Joshua with a good name the way he did with Moses, the way God said he would. Everything is working out great. But after such momentum, we, end, we hit chapter 7, verse 1, and it stops us in our tracks. The people of Israel broke faith. Something has happened and we had better pay attention to what? Joshua becomes the contrast to Israel. Faithful obedience brought blessings. Disobedience brought cursings. We have this contrast set up going from 627 to 71. In fact... The description of God's relationship with Israel is a stark one. The anger of the Lord burned. 7.1 also gives us the basis for this contrast. With the people breaking faith, it's basically like saying they didn't do what they said they were going to do. Joshua had said, I'm going to lead the people. He's going to be strong and courageous. He's going to remember the word of the Lord and he's going to engage in obedience. Oh, but something has happened. Now, granted, 7-1 doesn't tell us what. All we know is that something happened. So when verse 2 hits, all we know is that there's something. But you notice in verse 2, in fact, all the way through verse, boy, forever, we're not even told who Achan is. The genealogy is just there to say something's coming. It takes a while to get to him. But let's pay attention while we're here talking about obedience. A principle. And it's a principle that everybody here understands, and probably nobody has thought to even voice it out loud because it's so obvious. Obeying God is good, disobeying God is bad. Okay? Everybody gets that already. You probably never even thought to say it out loud. Like, when was the last time you described to yourself how to walk? Well, you put the right foot in. Wait, that's, that's not walking. You put the right foot down. There you go. And then the left foot down, and, and you just keep going. Right? Nobody has thought to describe walking because it's so obvious. 
Nobody has thought to describe the connection between obedience and being good and disobedience being bad. But that's the, that's the facts. In fact, Psalm 19 has a bunch of little couplets in poetic verse about how good things are. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. They are good and right and beautiful. Yeah. Moreover, when God gives a command, when he reveals his will, he is pleased simply by giving the command. He is pleased by the command. Okay? The command is good and it's pleasing to God. There's a second step in this principle. The command is not just good and pleasing to God, but obedience to the command is also good. We see this borne out in the first chapters of Joshua. Obedience is good. The good things happen. They cross the river. They get into the land. They destroy Jericho. Obedience is good. But obedience also pleases God. God is pleased by our obedience. And then, of course, there's this third step in this principle. Not only is the command good and pleasing to God, and not only is obedience good and pleasing to God, the outcome of this obedience is also good. See, the command to destroy Jericho wasn't just to see if they're going to obey or not. There's actually a benefit of Jericho being destroyed. The command to get rid of the sinful influence was good, and when it actually happened, that's that much better. Not only that, but you, you may see this coming, the outcome of obedience is also pleasing to God. He desired Jericho to no longer have a sinful influence on Israel. This is a compounding of good. It's good upon good upon good. And a compounding of God's pleasure also. It builds itself up. So what could the problem be? Well, this principle has an equal and opposite that's also true. Disobedience to God is not good. And it is a displeasure to God. Now, when we say displeasure, that, that sounds kind of prosaic. Kind of, bleh, he's just not pleased. Actually, God doesn't go from pleased to just nothing. He goes from pleased past that to displeasure. God as being infinitely holy knows how to be infinitely pleased, but also infinitely displeased. The word used here can be translated knows. His anger is against them. His nose is against them. His face is against them. He's, he's in their face. The anger of the Lord is, is not a general disdain from a distant God. It's personal and intense. It's right in their face. When God's anger is against somebody, he is actively engaging in destroying them. First Peter put it this way, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. When it says that the anger of the Lord burnt against them, there's gonna, we are going to see God's sovereign influences take action to destroy Israel. This is intense stuff. How against them is he? Deuteronomy 28, 27 is where God is describing the blessings and the cursings of this covenant he has with Israel. We're being made one, and if you're obedient, yay, the Lord will cause your enemies to rise against you and be defeated before you. you they shall come against you one way, but flee before you seven ways. That sounds pretty good. The enemy comes and attacks, right? They seem pretty unified, but God is going to work on your side so much, they won't even have an organized retreat. They're just going to run it everywhere. Of course, 28.25 says... Of the covenant cursings for disobedience, the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them, but flee seven ways before them. You shall be a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. Something so detestable that people would turn their face from you because it's so disfigured. God doesn't just remove his protection. 
for those who break the covenant. He engages his anger against them. This is what's happening here in Joshua. They've broken the covenant. The covenant cursings are being enacted against them. Now they don't realize that though. So 7-2, Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai. He's engaging in doing the things that he's been taught to do. Moses sent in spies. We're going to look at stuff. Joshua sent in spies to see Jericho. It's all working out good. Joshua's going to send in spies to look at Ai. It's all working out, right? He just doesn't realize that he's leading a people of cursed position. Okay? Now, some Bible commentators say that sending in the spies was in itself an act of sin. He didn't uh, inquire of the Lord before doing this. Okay? I, I disagree with the intent of what they're saying, and this is why. The text actually tells us why God's mad. He's not mad because they didn't inquire of him to go to Ai. He's mad because they broke faith concerning the things of Jericho. So rather than saying um, this only take a small number of soldiers thing is um, the reason why God's anger was against them, we actually see it as a result of God's anger being against them. God actually somehow, and we're not told how, engaged in leading them to defeat. God was against them. And, and the outcome of it is, is verse 5. And what poetic irony here. The men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Cherubim and struck them with the, uh, at the descent and the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Do you remember that terminology? Back in Joshua 2, Rahab had said kind of the same thing. Joshua 2.11 Rahab is describing how scared Jericho is of Israel. And we, we in Jericho, we had heard how you guys destroyed all of these bad guys on the east side of the Jordan River. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. And there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. When Israel had a right understanding of the holiness and the power of God, they walked in victory. But as soon as they rejected it, God was against them and their hearts melted. That's a sad state of affairs. See, when Joshua cries out to God in verses 7 through 9, he has a deep, deep pain. And the pain comes from something that we all do. Do you know that everybody here interprets life? Do you, have you ever thought about how you view life? There's actually three steps in this thing, how it plays out. We start with our preconceived beliefs and ideas. This is true, this is true, and this is true. All right? And then second step, we experience life. We either do stuff or we watch somebody else do stuff. Okay? The third step is where we say... My beliefs are this, but this happened. What caused that? Is there somebody who needs blamed? Is there somebody who needs praised? Is there, is there something that needs changed? Do we have to fix something? We take our preconceived ideas, we compare it to what actually happened, and then we, we try to make sense of it somehow. And Joshua does that. But what he ends up doing in verses 6 through 9 is he's almost accusing God of something. He's almost accusing him of injustice. Why did you even bring us here? Just to be destroyed by the people who live in this land? What would it take to get Joshua to get to that point of accusing God of being unjust? Just to be clear, God is perfectly just. Everything that God does is absolutely just. He never wrongs anyone. In fact, even if, when you look at Israel, God's leading them to be destroyed. Did they deserve that? Yeah, that's called justice. God is a just God. Tell me, Joshua, how did you get to the point of thinking that God was unjust? It comes from the preconceived idea that Israel is righteous. Look at the nation. We did everything that we were supposed to do. We walked around the city of Jericho and we blew trumpets and, and yelled. And the wall, when the walls came down, we went in and we killed everybody. 
We did everything that we were supposed to do, but you, God, you didn't fulfill your end of the bargain. You haven't been protecting us. You're unjust. That's actually, okay, if he's right that Israel is, is two thumbs up, he's right. God's been unjust. But his problem is not in his interpretation. His problem is in the understanding of what is true. These preconceived ideas, the very first step. What he didn't realize is he had a messed up theology. He had counted Israel is righteous and God is unjust. So when verse 10 hits, the Lord says to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. How do you deal with a situation where you're suffering from bad theology? You've got a messed up understanding of reality. I'm a good person and bad things are happening to me. God's being unjust. You know what the answer to that is? The truth. You actually live in a sinful world and you're a sinner also. We have to fix our mind on what's true. Now, if you're enduring suffering, is that a guarantee that you somehow sinned? No. But my words start there. Start there. If things are going bad, you should be asking that question right away. Have I done something? Am I responsible for someone else who's done something? Or do I just flat out live in a world that's been fractured by sin? But if you immediately go to someone else is the problem, it comes from the idea that you actually think that you're right, good, and perfect. Humility should be the very first step here. So God humbles Joshua. Get up. You don't have anything to worry about. You think Israel is righteous and I'm, non, and I'm unjust? It's actually the opposite. Israel has sinned and I'm perfectly just in the way that I'm treating them. So get up. Look at the motivation from God. He doesn't just whisper the truth and walk away and let him stew in it for a while. He doesn't just give the truth and give him time. He grabs him. Get up. You are not right in your head. Fix what's right in your head so you can fix your actions. And he says it twice. Get up. Joshua is burdened by his own misconceptions. Oh, oh, how many have ever been here in that situation? You're suffering from your own bad thinking. Man, we can be our own worst enemies. Get up. God is not to be trifled with. He is majestic and beautiful and scary beyond belief. We had better recognize his holiness. So Joshua gets up, right? God had given him the, the command. This is how we're going to figure out who the bad guy is, right? And wasn't that a long and tedious section to have to listen to? My word. Tribes and Zerahites, Z Zabdi and Carmi. Man, there's a good reason why we don't use those names anymore. <laughs> we find the guy. Joshua had done it. By the way, just as a side note, verse 16. Verse 16, you see how it starts? He rose early in the morning. That shows up about five other times in the previous six chapters. When there's something to be done, Joshua gets on it. He gets on it. He's not on his face. He's not crying. He's not covering himself with soot and ash and sackcloth and all this other stuff. He knows what's to be done. He gets up and he does it. Early in the morning, he got up and he figured out who this was. And so then they, they approach uh, Achan. Verse 19. Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him. Do you know what he's saying there? He's saying... If you were to declare your sin, that would actually prove that God has been just in his treatment of us. To confess your sin is to glorify God. He is the right one. He is the just one. When we stand before God, a simple confession of our sins is glorifying to him and it praises his name. And what's his description? I saw all this stuff. How much could this be worth? A lot of money. Commentators say 
This gold and this silver represents probably a lifetime's income for the average laborer. That's a lot. Okay, but check this out. God's not only holy, his work is holy. I don't care what your reason is, Achan. My holiness is bigger than you. And so God engaged a command to put Achan and all those under his responsibility to death. To cleanse the the nation of Israel of sinful influence. The work of God is holy. The whole nation took this family out. And yes, it was a family. And they stoned them to death and burned all of their possessions and their bodies together. And they put a giant pile of stones on it to remind themselves God's holiness, when it is forsaken, ends up like that. That is a weighty, weighty memorial. Anyone in the camp could, end up, could have ended up being under that pile. What's the difference between Achan and everybody else? Everybody else had upheld God's holiness. He gave a command and we're going to obey him. Achan said, I see what I see with my physical eyes and I desire it more than God's pleasure. That's the idea of coveting. As it turns out, when you look at this amount of money, which again, it's a lot of money, and this cloak... This cloak of Shinar, we're not told exactly what it is, but it's intended to represent, um, like if you were to wear it, people would think you're a pretty good guy. You, you're, you, you got, you got some, some wealth. You're respected. This, just wearing this cloak would get you into the best restaurants. Wearing this cloak would get you into the, the, the most powerful gatherings there are. Achan found something that would provide for all of his needs and give him a good name. And he went after it. Wait a second. I thought God is the one who gives his people all of their provision and protection and gives them a good name. The coveting of these things was Achan's participation in rebellion against God in every possible way. And God found him. Tell me, was Achan reveling in his wealth? Was he spending it left and right? Lifetime's income, we're going to blow it in the first year. Okay, wearing the cloak and being condescending to all the other fools. Are you kidding? He was hiding it. What benefit did Achan gain from stealing the stuff from God? Not even a little bit. Even, even a fool would have been wearing the cloak around. Here's Achan. He gains nothing from it, and yet his heart's condition was rebellion against God, and he withheld the things that were supposed to be devoted to God for destruction. So when we see all of this wrap up, we have some some details. Did you know that Joshua and Achan actually have a lot in common? Joshua had bad theology that led him to despair. Achan had bad theology that led him to sin. Both of them didn't recognize God's holiness, and they acted in accordance with that. Okay. In fact, <laughs> you should be certain from stories like this that your sin has effect on other people. Okay. The entire na- camp of Israel was devoted to destruction because of Achan's sin. Okay. And even though God protected the rest of the nation and identified just Achan and his family, his family still suffered from Achan's sin. This, your sin has vastly greater consequences than you realize on yourself, your family, your community, everyone around you. And we're not even talking about open, blatant sin. We're talking about the hidden sin of the heart. When we, when we see the, in this story the, the, the heart of Achan, we should recognize ourselves. You know, Jericho was supposed to be this devoted thing. The destruction of it would be pleasing to God. It would represent the the conquest of all the land of of Canaan. Right? All of it was supposed to be destroyed. All of the gold and silver was supposed to be given to God in the tabernacle. It was all supposed to be devoted to God. But Achan withheld. Obviously, the disobedience there is a major problem. But... 
when, when we see this role that the destruction of Jericho was supposed to play, we see that it was actually insufficient. It, didn't, it wasn't actually destroyed. And it causes us to remember what the, the writer of Hebrews said, that what Jesus provided us was sufficient. It took two tries to destroy Jericho, but Jesus did his perfect sacrifice once for all. What was supposed to be this beautiful picture of God destroying sin and all of its many facets, it actually ended up being a work tainted by more sin. With Jesus, no sin can taint his sacrifice. When Jesus died for your sin as a first fruit sacrifice in the war against the sin in your life, it was a full and complete sacrifice. Every one of your sins paid for at the cross. You, there's nothing lacking in a sacrifice. Fully and completely paid for and fully and completely potentially forgiven. But what about the heart of Achan? Do we find it in us? My sin may be fully and completely paid for in, on the cross, but am I still holding on to something that he died for? Am I still holding on to something in my sinful past that I think is more valuable than God's holiness? Am I still holding on to lust that Jesus died to separate me from? I might, I might have this lovely uh, family relationship with my wife, and, and as long as everybody can see it, it's great, but what happens if my, my hidden sin is pornography? I might be a self-controlled person and trustworthy at all times, but maybe I'm just good at hiding my alcoholism. Or my drug addiction. I may act like I'm, I'm the greatest person ever. And I just long for, for God's glory in all things. But honestly the thing that kills me is when somebody robs my glory. When we're, when we're talking about the hidden sin of the heart. God knows it. You don't actually hide it from him. But we do try to hide it from other people. God is calling you out. It's time to confess. When Joshua spoke to Achan, glorify God and give him praise today. Jesus' sacrifice was fully and complete. Give it fully to him. Don't hold on to anything else. But if you're holding on to it, you confess it. Okay? These habitual, long-lasting things are hard to root out of life. Especially if you started hiding it decades ago. You may have even forgotten it's under your tent. Those hidden things are a painful thing. And they destroy your relationship with God. But 1 John 1, 9 gives us great encouragement. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is the Holy One and you are not. So today, if you are feeling the sting of conviction, which honestly probably most of us are, it's time for confession. And if you have a desire to pray with somebody, find somebody. Elders, pastors, friends, family. Don't hold on to these things that Christ has already paid for. Don't hold on to these things that he's already set you free from. It's completely and fully finished in Christ. I... I <laughs> I entreat you today to give it up to him. If you do need, if you do need to talk to somebody, I will stay up, up front. And after we're done singing, I, I encourage you to come talk with me, uh, with Pastor Josh, with any of the elders. Um, today is the day to be set free from our withheld sins. Let's pray. Lord, you are a holy God and you call us to be holy. And so, Lord, work in us a desire to give up sin. I thank you for a perfect sacrifice in Christ. Not something that we're continually looking to figure out if it was good enough, but we know it is absolutely perfect. So I thank you for that. But I also pray that you would be um, breaking hearts and breaking pride uh, today, knowing that you have a desire to set us free from these besetting sins, these hidden sins that we hold on to. And so, Lord, today, strengthen your people. Uh, to confess and to repent and to glorify you. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.